You know? Yep. Okay. Um, yeah. So I know that the title of this talk was originally adding tracers to the Mob Six framework, and then when I was always thinking about it, I um, felt like I wanted to kind of split it up a little bit because really, if you want to go through the mechanics of actually adding a tracer into Mob Six, it's best to do that kind of in an interactive thing where everyone has their own thing and can modify the source code themselves. So I'm actually going to split this talk up into two separate ones, both dealing with the tracers. Um, and then the first section of the talk, I want to talk about like, you know, basically what tracers are. And then um, probably of salience to a lot of people's analysis and research is how to actually construct a tracer budget and some of the terms that might go into that. Um, so to dive in real quick, um, whoop. Ah, here we go. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I've got to, I didn't start on the first page. Okay. Um, so just want to go through real quick, like, you know, what tracers are, um, especially for, because it's supposed to be a seminar and to just motive, define some terms so that we can all understand and we're talking from the same uh, point of reference. So uh, in general, we talk about kind of active and passive tracers, right? So the active tracers are the ones that directly affect the momentum equations through the equation of state. Um, you know, so if you look at the primitive equations, one of the fundamental equations is that equation of state, right? The density of water being dependent on temperature, salinity, and pressure. That temperature and salinity are, those are both tracers, right? They flow with the water. Um, and if you are talking about this in a, either in a full fluid dynamics context or an ocean model, these, it is the conservative temperature and the absolute salinity, right? And so these are all conserved quantities within the ocean um, subject to their sources and sinks. Um, then we have things that I like to call quasi-active tracers. Um, I don't know if there's a formal definition of this, but this is my own internal way of thinking about them. And um, these are things that essentially influence the fluxes of an active tracer. So the classic example of this, of this is something like chlorophyll, right, which is a biogeochemical tracer, um, but it does affect the absorption of shortwave radiation within the water column. So its presence and its concentration does feedback into the momentum equations, not directly, but kind of in a in a, another step by modifying heat fluxes um, and shortwave absorption. And then we have um, the third kind of class of tracers I like to think about, which are the purely passive tracers. Um, these are things that in no way can affect anything, any of the physics of the model, right? They just flow along and they do whatever they do. They can be interdependent on each other and they can be dependent on the active tracers, but they themselves do not actually change the flow at all. Um, so these are the these are probably the largest class of tracers that people think about on, a, on most on most time or uh, most of the time, and because they include things like the biogeochemistry, right? So the oxygen, the nutrients, and the phytoplankton. And I think you could probably you might be able to make an argument that some of these things affect the chlorophyll, and so then they can also affect the active tracer, and so they might be quasi-active. But um, I'm just gonna just take the simple thing that. Um, if it's more than one step from away removed from an active tracer, that I just call that pretty much a purely uh, passive tracer. Um, these also include things like the radioactive isotopes, um, carbon-14, carbon-13, helium, iodine, cesium, you know, all these, all these nice radioactive tracers that we can use to kind of as patterns of circulate or as tracers of the ocean circulation. Um, transient tracers, CFCs, SF6, um, and then also things like Keith mentioned, including ideal age tracers or dye tracers. Um, and so when you one of the really key things when you're talking about building a tracer tendency budget, um, especially in a model like MOM6, which is a finite volume, is to remember that the model, a finite volume model, means that every point actually is, encompasses a volume. So in most of the time when we're learning about GFD and fluid dynamics, we almost talk, we almost exclusively talk about transport. Um, in kind of a infinitesimal volume, right? So you talk about something like this dp dt term. Um, and what we mean by this dp dt term, um, sometimes we refer to this as a tendency, um, is that this is a concentration of a tracer um, in an infinitesimal volume that's changing in time. Well, because we don't have an infinitesimally small volume in the model, right, it's been discretized in the vertical, um, it's really a tracer content that's conserved in the model. And by tracer content, I mean it's the concentration of the tracer multiplied by this finite volume. Um, in the case of a model like MOM6, the, the volume is purely, the, the, the change in volume as a, as a function of time is strictly due to the thick, changing of the thickness of a, of a grid cell, right? The area of a grid cell never changes, it's just its thickness. Um, one thing to point out too is that 
this tracer content being conserved instead of tracer tendency does also apply to the Z star coordinate that's in MOM6 because the Z star coordinate stretches, um, stretches the water column as due to barotropic movement. So if you're looking at this kind of in a following point of volume context, um, this equation up here, this D by D by DT B times H, where phi is the tracer concentration, um, this is, a, uh, or this should be an approximation, but in case, in any case, how you do this is that you look at it as a convergence of fluxes within the box. So in this particular case, you have this phi at some time plus one, and, and the thickness of the cell at time plus one, minus phi times phi at the original time times the thickness at that original time. And then that, that difference there, that difference in time is equal to the convergence of the fluxes. So this fj plus one is, let's say, the upstream face of a cell, and f sub j is the downstream face, plus any internal sources or sinks. So this is a pretty crude diagram that kind of illustrates this, but um, I just wanted to go real quick and talk about how you might actually think about this. Um, so if you have this as where the size of the arrows is directly proportional to um, the magnitude of the flux, then you have, for example, horizontal advection that might be happening. Those are these horizontal arrows here. So you have a big arrow leaving the box, and you have a smaller arrow entering the box. If you take the difference of those two, you get a net convergence of those fluxes. So the tendency should be positive. Likewise, if you look at the vertical portions of these things, uh, the vertical arrows, these are these might be something like a, um, the vertical remapping or some kind of or any kind of vertical fluxes in general. Um, in this case, both arrows are pointing into the box, which obviously means that you should have a net increase in the content of the box itself. Um, so that's just kind of the way to think about it. Um, the biggest takeaway is that just remember, we're in a finite volume context. So that basically means that you should always be thinking about these fluxes and these convergence of fluxes as surrounding um, a finite volume. And so when you're thinking about the tracers, it's not necessarily the concentration that's conserved, it's really the tracer content. Um, so looking at this in MOM6, um, this applies directly to the AL mode and not necessarily the layer mode because that has different things. Um, you talk, we can think about what goes into this heat budget. And when we talk about heat budget, we're talking about if you have um, a full model step on the left-hand side of an equation, and you have on the right-hand side individual processes, those should actually balance such that the total change in tracer content is equal to the total change in each of the individual processes that happen to that tracer. Um, and so this is a list of, I think, eight, eight uh, processes that happened and changed, that happened over the course of time step and may change the um, the heat content of a, of a single tracer cell. So this includes the horizontal invection. Um, so horizontal invection is only done once, but it is the result of the cumul accumulated mass fluxes from the resolved circulation, so from the dynamics, plus anything from the mesoscales, so that tends to be kind of this Jack McWilliams um, bolus, bolus fluxes, and also the Fox Kemper submesoscale mixed layer restratification. Um, neutral diffusion, I've talk talked about a month or so ago at this point, is also another process that happens. Um, lateral boundary diffusion, Gustavo talked about that as well. Um, this vertical transport is, remember, is not, it's no, not an explicit advection. So it's a, it's a result of the regridding remapping. Um, there's also a vertical diffusion. So that is all the parameterized vertical, uh, vertical diffuse, turbulent diffusivity. So that can include things like um, the shear driven mixing, any boundary layer mixing. Um, parameterized convection, parameterized um, double diffusive mixing. These are all sorts of it. And again, this vertical diffusion is the, the actual the vertical diffusion equation itself is solved based on the aggregated uh, turbulent diffusivity from each and every one of those processes. And of course, for heat, bu for heat budget, uh, the surface boundary fluxes are extraordinarily important. Um, there are diagnostics for both the aggregated ones and also the individual ones. Um, Gustavo has a nice notebook that kind of shows the relationship between each and every one of those so that you can ensure that you're not double counting or undercounting the fluxes, um, the surface fluxes. There's also frazzle formation, right? So if the, if, when, when the, a water column goes below freezing, it wants to form frazzles so, so that it, the, that latent heat of fusion to form the ice 
actually heats up the water column and brings above freezing, and that that I, that frazzle formation can actually be exported. So that's another heat uh, heat source to a single cell that potentially might happen. And then there's also the geothermal or internal heating of a cell. Um, so all those things are going on in the OM4 configuration, the GFD OM4 configuration. And I'm pretty sure all these are also happening in part one. Um, so one thing that I really want to point out, because this kind of threw me for like, when I was first thinking about the heat budget in MOM6, is that each and every one of these diagnostics, including the surface boundary fluxes, um, if you think you have more than just the, uh, including the radiation, um, these are all 3D diagnostics. Um, surface boundary fluxes is a little bit of a weird one to think about as a 3D diagnostic, but it's because in MOM6 we actually do allow for um, the for both heat fluxes and evaporated fluxes to be um, taken out of some cells in the in the um, near the surface and not just the surface cell itself. Um, so that's another thing to think to, to remember too is that none of not all of none of these none of these fluxes are necessarily um, two dimensional. Most of these are potentially three dimensional. And then the last thing to think about too is that sometimes we don't care about constructing the full 3D heat budget, but sometimes we only really care about what the vertical integral is. And so in the when you do those vertical integrals, some of these things actually drop out, including the vertical transport and the vertical diffusion. Um, we've actually spent, there's been a few of us who spent a bit of time trying at different points in time, trying to make sure that the heat budget and the salt budgets close. Um, Gustavo's done it. Um, Graham McGillchrist, who's a GFDL in Princeton, has done it, and I've also done it at some point. So um, I feel like this is a relatively common question for um, for us to get. I know that Gustavo's filled that question a couple of times. I've filled that question a couple of times. So this is a. I just want to emphasize that this is a non-trivial task, and that um, there's a lot of room for error and a lot of pitfalls when you're trying to close these budgets. So uh, instead of reinventing the wheel. I think it's probably best to uh, contact one of us who's had to go through that pain before. Um, and the last thing I want to make mention, and I think this is probably pretty uh, pretty important, especially for a general audience, is that these um, these tracer budgets close in diagnostic coordinates, right? So, MOM six, especially, we've heard a lot about the hybrid coordinate that's being used. Um, that's not always a really easy coordinate to actually do analysis in because it does transition from Z star to something that's isopycnal like. And so, it, and it's not clear what that transition is. There's no way of knowing whether it's in a more of an isopycnal state or more in a level state. Um, so we, the diagnostic manager has this capability of using that same high order regridding remapping to go from the NIT model's native coordinate to any diagnostic coordinate. So one of the common things that people that that's provided is um, you can output the diagnostics in um, density space, right? So you can do all of your analysis just purely in density, or you could output it onto level surfaces, which might be useful if you're trying to do a direct comparison um, against a, a data product that is in level coordinates. Um, I'm working with Graham right now um, on also outputting coordinates onto a conservative temperature coordinate, right? Where it's like, okay, well, we can think about all these things, um, uh, all these things that affect the tracers as where the vertical coordinate is temperature based only. So that might be a kind of a new novel analysis. There's other coordinates that could easily be uh, implemented as part of that. So if you thought about some really clever ways of doing analysis based on age vertical coordinate or an auction vertical coordinate, these are all things that we might potentially be able to support in the near term future. Um, we have double checked that this heat budget closes in the OM, GFDL OM4 configuration and probably the others um, in the native coordinate, the Z star coordinate, and the isopycnals coordinate. Um, all this regridding and mapping is actually done at the time step of the model itself. So you don't have to worry about time averaging effects of the regridding operator itself because. Uh, because it is done at the same frequency as all these tendencies are actually posted. Um, and I do want to also emphasize, and I think this has become, this has raised, we've raised this as an issue before, is that this is a great feature of the model, but it does become fairly expensive because the regretting remapping operation um, is a non-trivial kind of operation, but depending on the kind of analysis you do, it might be worth 
the computational hit that you'll take. I mean, I really just want to advertise this, and I, I think that we're all on board that MOM6 is a nice model, but I really want to say that MOM6 is a model that's particularly well suited for order mass transform transformation analysis. Um, you know, any other model that I can think of um, doesn't, you almost have to do that remapping to um, isopycnal space on your own from time average quantities, which you know, you're not quite sure what the nonlinears might be, but MOM6 can just kind of do it for you. And it's, you can output it and it's just a one-time setup to define what isopycnal range and resolution you want. Um, and you just get all these diagnostics and you can just register any of these tenancy diagnostics um, on an isopycnal grid, which is really, really powerful. Um, and it probably is about as accurate as you can get, um, as opposed to relying on these time average tracers and doing that transformation offline. Um, so I just want to just say then, um, if you have any questions about constructing the heat, the heat budgets or the tracer budgets at any other point, um, I, I'm happy to talk about them more, um, especially for your particular tracer. Um, but there's also a lot of the things that come with these tendencies that just automatically come whenever you register a tracer in MOM6. So I'm going to transition now from this talk, kind of talk about a tracer budget to something that's more uh, specific to the implementation of tracers within MOM6. Um, and I'm going to refer to this part of the talk as kind of a description of the MOM6 tracer framework itself. Um, before going into the kind of the source code level of things, I want to do just a high level overview of how tracers are treated in MOM6. Um, one thing that's really important is that we actually never make a distinction uh, in the algorithm between the active and passive tracers. There is a full um, 4D array with all the tracers in them, but we never do something like the index of the temperature tracer or the index of the salinity tracer. Um, if you need to use temperature and salinity in a subroutine or a model or in a module, um, you should really be using this thermobar pointers type um, that's usually passed around the model with a variable called TV. Uh, other than that, though, the tracer registry itself doesn't say this is an active tracer, this is a passive tracer. It's just these are all the tracers regardless of what they are. Um, the other thing that's really important to know when you're using the tracers in the model is that these horizontal and vertical processes, sourcing and calculations are called at the frequency specified by DT therm. Um, so DT therm can be a longer time step than the baroclinic time step DT, right? So the dynamic time step, um, so X such as the baroclinic time step DT, so uh, that's basically the dynamics time step. So then what, they, what we call the thermodynamics time step can actually happen on a much larger time scale. Um, which is really good because, the, as I think Bob's talk mentioned, the dynamics uh, can has to be run for stability at a much shorter time resolution. But we know in general that things like infection actually have much longer time scales in the ocean. So, for example, you might have a one-hour time step for your dynamics, but you could do a three-hour or six-hour time step for the thermodynamics. Um, this also does mean, though, that if you have some process that needs, as for example, a biological process that happens on a much quicker time scale that you have to deal with that um, within your module itself and you have to subcycle the um, those source and sync calculations um, separately. And that's your responsibility how to do that. But again, emphasize that this DT that is a subcycling that's based on the quote unquote thermodynamic time step of the model. Um, the only things that are done and handled by MOM6 itself is advection and horizontal diffusion. Anything else that it might affect the tracer has to be done by the tracer module. Um, this also does include, include vertical diffusion, and I'll get into one of the reasons why we make each and every one of the module tracer modules do vertical diffusion on its own later. Um, but just keep just remember that if you're developing your module. And you're being like, oh, well, this looks great, except for the fact there's no vertical diffusion. It's just because uh, it's not included. And then the last thing for people who are migrating from, to MOM6 from a different uh, numerical model, for example, MOM5 or NEMO, is that there's no tendency array in MOM6. There's no tracer tendency arrays. Uh, MOM6 basically just 
essentially or the time steps the each and every one of the tracers um, and doesn't do anything like a split leapfrog time scheme or anything like that. So there's no tendency to calculate. MOM6 expects each tracer module to do their own time stepping itself and update their own concentration arrays. Um, so that's one other thing to keep in mind. Um, so now, having moved out the very kind of high level description of things, I'm going to now kind of talk and just go transition more into the mechanics of how the tracers are actually done and fit into the rest of uh, MOM6. So at the source of the framework is the MOM tracer registry. So this keeps track of all the tracers, both the active and the passive. And like I said before, there is no distinction between those between those two classifications. It's just all the tracers. Um, the tracer registry also defines a tracer type, uh, which has information in, in terms of both the name of the tracer, it stores the array that has the tracer in that actually has the tracer concentrations. Um, it has things like the units of the fluxes of it, the units of the tracer, and also all diagnostic and also a lot of diagnostics that are relevant to all the tracers. So um, this includes all these physical processes like the infection, the diffusion, and the vertical remapping. So by just registering the tracer, you can get you get all, all these things will happen. Uh, the diffusion will be zero unless you handle that within uh, your own module, just as a reminder. But these things all kind of come part and parcel, and you get all the power of the regrading remapping that I was talking about before. So just we have to close the tracer budget for temperature and salinity, but we can also this also really helps to do um, analysis of passive tracers, for example, by a few chemical tracers in any coordinate that is desirable for your analysis. So outside of the MOM tracer registry, there's also this uh, a, a source code file called MOM tracer flow control. And this really serves as the main interface between MOM6 and each of these individual tracer modules. Um, and it is set, if you look into that source code, it has all these hooks that call various subroutines within each tracer module. And that's, the, that's what I'll transition to and go through in the next following slides. Um, so for, in terms of thinking about what's actually happening to the tracers, um, there's some things that, there's four discrete kind of steps to what happens when you are thinking about trying to implement a new tracer in the model. First, there's this thing called, that we call registered tracers. Uh, so registered tracers uh, happens before the initialization where we use an initialization to basically say, what are the initial conditions for this tracer? Registered tracer is basically just says, says to MOM6, I have a tracer, it needs to be added to the registry. Um, and then, and, and you need, you're gonna need to do something with it. So it also does takes the trigger options for a tracer module from the MOM input. Um, and then after the call to, to this tracer, or after the call to register tracers, even if you did nothing else, the tracer is going to be infected and diffused and also added to the restart. Um, of course, most of the time, that tracer array will be initialized to zero or random numbers, depending on um, how you set up your compiler options. So a lot of times, you're going to want to perform your own initialization. So that's what we call the initialization routines. And you can either, either get it from a restart or you can cold start and have your own uh, initialization routine that you've constructed within your tracer module. One thing to point out too is that MOM6 does have the capability of restarting just the physics and not necessarily the biogeochemistry. So that's referred to kind of in the documentation and in the code as tracers can reinitialize. So you could take a physics, a, a, rest, a MOM6 restart that has no tracers in it. Um, and then if you then enable a tracer module, it'll essentially go through the initialization routine of the tracer module as if it was a restart. Um, so this is really valuable if you're doing something like you have a restart from a long physical model spin up, and now you want to add tracers to it. You don't want to have to start your model all from scratch and get the dynamics and the physics to uh, come into equilibrium. So after that kind of those first two steps, which are part of the initialization of the model, 
there's then the time loop. Um, and then the time loop itself, these two uh, subroutines are always called. So there's the call tracer column functions. Um, and this does any and all vertical processes. This includes um, concentration and dilution of the tracer due to freshwater fluxes. Because um, remember, like again, that we're conserving tracer content and not necessarily tracer concentration. So even if nothing happened to a surface cell of the model, except for evaporation, you would see a change in concentration because you've evaporated some water, so you've reduced your thickness. Um, so in order to update the concentration, you have to take into that account um, into account of that concentrating effect due to a purely freshwater flux, even if there's no flux of that tracer itself with that associated with that evaporation itself. Like there's no, um, for example, you might think of something like um, evaporation of salts that might go into the, um, go into something. Uh, tracer column functions also applies the vertical column, vertical mixing. Um, and as part of the vertical mixing, it's a little bit of a misnomer because there's a bunch of other things that can also happen in that vertical mixing routine. That includes um, the application of things like the flux boundary conditions, either at the surface or the bottom. Um, and it can also include a vertical velocity. So this is particularly useful for if you have something, let's say um, a sinking particle, like a discrete particular organic model that you have specifying falls at a certain rate. This, that routine will also take care of it. Um, I'll show you what that call actually looks like um, in the following slides. And then lastly, these tracer column functions update the concentrations from these internal source and sink calculations. So again, remember that MOM6 has no tendency arrays. All the tracer modules are expected to handle the time stepping themselves. And then the second part of the time loop is the call tracer stocks. And this is where you calculate and restore your global inventory of the tracers. Um, that one's pretty standard. You can pretty much copy and paste that from any of the existing tracer modules. And then the very last thing, when the module, when when mom when a mom six integration is done, goes through a finalization routine, which typically just frees any of the allocated memory so that you can ensure that there's no rear memory leaks. But these are kind of the four basic things that happen over the course of a mom six integration that focuses specifically on tracers. Um, so one of the tracer packages that uh, I that I'm going to use as an exam as a really simple example uh, to illustrate how the source code actually looks like when you're when you're developing a new tracer model is this thing that's called a boundary impulse tracer. Um, this is essentially a numerical analog of calculated Green's function, where you spike the surface cells to one to a concentration of one for some period of time, and then afterwards it's always set to zero. So if you want to think about it kind of in a more descriptive way, this is like a dye tracer that you inject for a certain period of time, um, where after that injection time, the surface becomes a sink of that tracer. And that is the only source and sink of the tracer itself. Um, there's a lot of literature that uses Green's functions. I'm not going to get into it. But one of the things that's nice about using it as an example is that it has very, very it has a very, very simple definition of its sources and sinks. So um, it's a minimal amount of very specific code that's done for this particular tracer. Um, so if you look in that module, this boundary impulse tracer mod, uh, module, its registration, so this register boundary impulse tracer, uh, has this configuration here, right? So it gets a parameter called the impulse source time, and it gets this option tracers may reinit. And this is what I was talking about before, where it's like, if the, if the tracer doesn't exist in a restart file, it will go through its own in, reinitialize, it, its own initialization routine um, in, in your new run. And then it allocates the tracer, right, the CS% percent tracer, um, and then sets it to zero. And then after that, it does this thing where it essentially registers the tracer itself um, on the right-hand side here, with all the information that you defined about what it is, including its flux units, its name, um, uh, and any other kind of metadata that is associated with that. Um, if you want to see all the possible fields you can set, you can just you can look at that um, the definition of this func of the subroutine in Mom Tracer Registry. Um, and then the other thing that has to be 
by, by default, whenever you register a tracer, it will automatically be registered. Uh, the concentration of it will be registered in the restart file. Um, but if there's any additional variable that might need to be in there, you have to explicitly say, I need this extra field to go into the, into the restart field. And so that's what this line down here does, this call register restart field. So this is the remaining time left to inject a tracer. Um, but the key thing to notice here is the absence of the, the need to say, I have a, I need to register the tracer concentrations as a restart. Um, and then, so that's the registration part of the uh, of tracer defin of tracer definitions. Um, so we're still in the initialization, the overall initialization stage of MOM6, but we've gone from registering to now initializing. Um, so here we're going to set the initial conditions, and so this is the a subroutine called initialize boundary impulse tracer, and we can say either it's coming if it's not coming from a restart. Um, then do this. Otherwise, uh, set it to one at the surface, essentially. Otherwise, it has already been initialized, and so it should not go through an initialization procedure. It should have already been initialized from the restart file. Um, and then the boundary impulse tracer column physics, this is the first part of it that's in the uh, that time loop that I was talking about. So this is now outside of the initialization, and this is now as mom is integrating forward in time. Um, so in AL mode, you have to do this thing called apply tracer boundary flexes in and out. And that is what will actually do this concentration or dilution of tracer due to freshwater fluxes. Um, and then after that, it does this vertical diffusion. So uh, vertical diffusion takes in the layer thicknesses and also these EA, EB terms. And so this EA, EB, is the stands for entrainment from above. So that's the entrainment rate from the layer above the layer that you're currently looking at, and entrainment below. So the entrainment of uh, the mass, the entrainment of a it's a mass flux from the bottom of the cell, from the bottom layer into the cell. So in the case of ale, the entrainment above is equal to the entrainment negative of the entrained below from the layer above. So it is symmetric, and so this ends up being diffusion. Um, in the case of the layer mode of the model, you can actually have a difference between those two, and that then is a net vertical transport um, of the tracer. So remember, that there's two modes of MOM6. There's the AL mode, which we pretty much talked about a lot, but then there's also the layer iso layered isopycnal mode of the model, which is more uh, similar to gold and him of um, CMIP5. Uh, and then uh, tracer vert diff also accepts a number of optional arguments where you can specify these boundary flexes or vertical syncing. Um, and this is all solved and done in one step using an implicit formulation um, that I think Bob has mentioned before. Right. And then so after that vertical diffusion has been done and those fluxes have been applied, now we do apply the sources and sinks. And so, like I said, for this boundary impulse tracer, it's pretty simple. Um, all you do is you set your surface layers to one. Uh, if you're if it's in the period of time when this when this tracer should be injected, and then for all the time after that, it is then the surface is just set to zero. So that was kind of a, a quick quick dive into a single tracer, but there are also a lot of other Tracer packages that come with MOM6, and also um, you might want to add your own tracers. So, a lot of the times it's far easier to just copy and paste one of the tracers, uh, one of the other existing tracer packages, and modify that um, to do all the things that you might need to do in your own tracer, um, your own, for your own tracer. Um, so, I would recommend if you just have something that's very simple, um, but it doesn't fall nicely into another category. Is just copy the boundary impulse tracer, delete all the things that look like they're associated with the boundary impulse tracer itself, um, and replace it with anything that you might need. Um, the, the other tracer packages that you, that could be interesting to look at, uh, kind of summarized here. Um, there's the Octave two kind of protocol for doing CFC eleven, CFC eleven, and CFC twelve. 
So this is kind of an interesting tracer if you will need an example of passing um, fluxes and information to and from the GFDL coupler. Um, there's an oil tracer, which I believe was put in by Alistair and Bob to do mo uh, modeling of the Deepwater Horizon spill. Um, these tracers are injected at the bottom and then they can potentially decay over time. Um, ideal age example uh, has ideal age and other age like tracers uh, in it. So those also have relatively simple source and sync terms if you're looking at something else that might need to, um, uh, that something else as an example other than the boundary impulse. The other thing that's nice about this one is that there's multiples of it, multiple tracers within this tracer package. So it gives you a good idea of how you might, if your tracer package needs more than one tracer, this is a nice example to follow as well. Um, one that might be useful for people if they're kind of doing these kind of artificial die release experiments is the die example one. Here you can specify an arbitrary number of tracers, uh, each which are all injected at their own lat long and depth range. Um, there's a, something that we call a pseudo salt tracer, which essentially is the salt, the salinity tracer in the model, and has all the boundary fluxes associated with salt um, also applied to it. And so this should reproduce the salinity tracer, but it's just kind of, if you're following it in the code, this is a little bit of an easier way to see this, um, being like, okay, here we know that salinity is reproducing or is, is being conserved. Um, if a pseudo salt isn't being done, or it doesn't have the exact same value, then we know that we've done something different with the past tracers, the active tracers, even though we have said that we shouldn't be doing anything differently. So that's kind of just, just a, a check, if you will, on uh, this kind of statement that we've made that active and active and passive tracers should be treated the same. Um, then there's one that we that's called Mom Generic Tracer. This contains all the interfaces to the GFDL biogeochemical models. So that includes bling, cobalt, um, radiocarbon, carbon 13. Um, and a whole bunch of other things that are in there. That source code, though, that actually does, um, that has the source sync calculations and all of that other stuff, um, is part of a separate repository. But just the interfaces to that are in Mom Generic Tracer. Um, and then Mike, who's going to be talking right after this one, is going to be talking about the Marble interface to Mom Sticks. Um, and Marble is kind of the NCAR led by Kemble interface for their, um, uh, their ecosystem model. Uh, and so then I'll just kind of stop right here. So there's a lot of people that you can ask. Um, and I'll also throw some of these people under the bus to field questions um, if you have them. So uh, one thing that we do in MOM6 is that there is automatic diagnostic checking. Um, so you never, you know that you won't accidentally change um, the diagnostics for a, a tracer. If you have questions about diagnostic remapping, there's that closing budgets, overall framework. You can direct all these questions to whoever you want. Um, I have a couple ideas for trace-related ideas and projects uh, that I can follow up with with other people if, they have, if you have specific questions about them. Um, otherwise, I'll just leave it here for you to read and um, field any questions that you might have right now. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, there were a couple of uh, clarifications made during the talk. Uh, Gustavo, do you want to fill in there? Uh, no, I just want to clarify that when uh, Andrew presented the way of closing the budget, he, he said that the NCAR should follow the same procedure as the OM4. And uh, it just a small correction that we had, we do not have the geothermal heating enabled at the moment. So everything else is exactly the same. Okay, thanks, Bishop. Thank you. And Bob Holberg. Right, so I, I can Bob, voice maybe Bob's part. left yeah. uh, anyway. So yeah, so the um, so the tracer registry is a forty pointer array, and so each package basically sets um, has their allocates their own memory within its, its own module, but the tracer registry points to the tracer three D arrays up for each of those past tracers within it. It is a, it's a way that we don't have to do unnecessary uh, memory copies of the arrays while also making sure that the trace registry always has access to all the concentrations at once. Okay, Keith. 
Hi, Andrew. Nice uh, overview. Thank you. Uh, by looking at the OCMIP CFC code, looks like it, the fluxes are being computed by the FMS coupler. So if we want to run with CFCs in CESM, we'll either need to re-implement those flux computations or figure out how to share code between the different couplers. And I'm curious what the rationale is for computing that flux in the flux coupler as opposed to within the ocean model itself. Uh, yeah, so this is, I think, a question that I had, and I will answer with the caveat that I could be wrong about this, but um, the GFDL coupler it is essentially, it's a, I think it, it arises from a design philosophy in the way that the, that the coupler, um, that GFDL designed its coupling framework. So ostensibly all fluxes should be, should be calculated in the coupler um, because GFDL coupler does uh, a, um, it does a, a refinement of the atmospheric and the ocean grids in order to calculate fluxes. So it's, it's fairly, it, get, it tries to retain as much resolution as possible. So, uh, and also within the coupler, you have things like the wind, uh, the wind speeds, um, you have the bulk formulae in there and all that. So that is why MOM6 doesn't, the, the OCMIP tracer module itself doesn't calculate the fluxes is because uh, it assumes that you have coupled to an atmospheric model or a data atmosphere model, um, in which case there's no, there's no way to really distinguish in MOM6, like um, whether you're in coupled mode or not. So that's just one of the assumptions in the design philosophy of it. It would be, I think, relatively easy to implement something like that, where it doesn't, where it just bypass the GFDL coupler code if you needed to do a surface flux calculation.